Hello geographers and welcome to another lesson from the Changing China unit. In this lesson we're going to answer this question. How did China get rich? The main focus is really to understand the economic and social reforms that have led to the rapid growth that we've seen in China. Now you can see this lesson is number five in the Changing China unit. We've done quite a lot about the changing population, so now we're really going to focus on the economy. So if you haven't done so already, make sure you grab a pencil, pen, paper and a ruler. First of all, if you can write down that title, how did China get rich? And then put today's date in your exercise book and underline both with a ruler. Number two, what I'd like you to focus on is the graph that you can see there in front of you. This is showing you the share of the world's GDP owned by each of the different countries and regions shown on the graph. GDP is basically a measure of a country's wealth. It stands for gross domestic product and include the goods and the services traded by that country. So it's a way of trying to understand basically how well the economy is doing in each of those countries and regions. Obviously, the greater percentage they have in terms of the world's GDP, the richer that country is in comparison to others. So what I'd like you to do is these four questions. You're going to focus specifically on China, which is shown by the red line on your graph. The first thing I'd like to do is to write a sentence or two that tells us the general pattern that's happened with China's GDP since the year one up to 2008. Secondly, you're then going to compare China's experience of its GDP with other countries. Are there other countries that have, a sim have had a similar experience to China? Thirdly, can you add some specific figures into your descriptions? So where you've perhaps wrote about the start points and end points, could you add some figures in there? Are there specific moments when perhaps it doesn't follow what you'd expect to be the trend? Are there things that have changed over time? So pause the video and see if you can describe China's changing share of the world's GDP or wealth. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to do that. I'm just going to briefly read through my own description of China's changing share of the GDP. You may wish to add a few extra notes into your own answer, but it's entirely up to you. You may have already written enough detail, but the important point is that you are backing up your key ideas with figures from the graph. So over the last 2000 years, China's share of the world GDP has seen significant change. I don't think you could really dispute that. There's been a lot of changes that have gone on in China's experience. Around 1000 AD, China and India shared around 50% of the world's GDP between them. So remember I said you need to try and compare it with other countries. That's one thing that you could perhaps mention. China's wealth fluctuated around this level until a dramatic drop between 1820 to 1950, when it lowered to around 5%. Again, notice how I'm using figures to back up the points that I'm making. Since the early 1970s, though, China's share of GDP has increased rapidly and is now at a similar level to Western Europe and the USA at just under 20%. Again, you can see a reference there to other countries and regions. You can also see kind of the speed of um, change that has occurred. And again, we're getting some key facts and figures in there. So have a look at your answer and see if you've done something along a similar line. If not, perhaps you want to make a few amendments to what you've written. OK, let's move on. Now, for a large part of this lesson, you're going to be watching a really great documentary, which really does look into detail about the changes that China has undergone and how that's had an impact on its economic growth. So you'll need to copy this link into your browser and hopefully your teacher has also given you the questions that you'll need to answer as you're watching the video clip. Now it is quite a long video clip, it's about 50 minutes. So you'll need to pause this and go and watch that video clip and as you do so, try to answer each of the questions that have been provided for you. 
and then come back onto the video and we'll review your answers. Okay, so hopefully you've had a good opportunity to watch that documentary. It really does go into some high level of detail. Now, some of the things you might not fully understood. So hopefully as we go through these questions, that will help make things a little bit clearer. So number one says, identify the challenges that China faced prior to the 1970s. China originally had a closed door policy. That means it didn't tend to trade or communicate with other capitalist nations. It very much kept itself to itself. But there were other challenges that China faced, including things like colonial oppression, where other countries pretty much exploited China for its resources. We've got the Japanese invasion. We've had civil war in China, and alongside that, we've had the Second World War, where 14 million have died. We've had famine and starvation that we've already talked about. There was a cultural revolution that attacked many of the Chinese traditions. And in many respects, there were no more than 10 years of stability prior to the 1970s. So very difficult in that backdrop to kind of promote economic development. Things were about to change though in the 1970s. In 1976, Deng Xiaoping was put in charge of education. What was the system like at the time? So initially, when he came in charge of education, the universities were closed, the exams were stopped, and after high school, students were sent to the countryside to learn what it was like to be a peasant. They had to engage in hard labour or become an apprentice in the factories. However, under Deng, exams were restarted and gave people the chance to go to university. There were only still places for 5% of those who sat the exam between the ages of 18 to 35. But why do you think this might have been important for China's development? Well, it then gave people the opportunity to gain more high level skills. And this was more important when he saw the level of the technology of other countries. And that brings us on to our next question number four. In 1978, Deng becomes the preeminent leader. He makes it his mission to go and visit other countries to see what they're doing. And he was expecting to see that capitalist nations, like the ones that he visited, would be exploiting their workers. He went to West Germany, he went to France, Switzerland, Belgium, Denmark, and then later Singapore and Japan. But no, this is not what he saw. Instead, he saw how far behind China was in terms of economics and science. He found that European leaders wanted to establish economic ties. In Japan, he saw trains travelling at over 200 kilometres per hour. But in China, they reached only 60. He saw extraordinary technology being used in factories and wanted to share the standard of living of workers with his own nation. As well as education, what other initiatives did Deng do to start the process of reforming China? Well, firstly, they discussed the economy and the agricultural system. Deng stated that the country should move away from ideology and focus on facts. Many of the hardline communists, though, were worried about this idea. Deng established relations with the President Carter in the USA, as he saw trade as a key to lifting people out of poverty. He also appealed to the United Nations for help with reform, and this included getting computer systems set up training people and putting data bases in place. In 1949, the landscape surrounding the Pearl River Delta saw decay in factories and poor infrastructure and few cars on the streets. Why had the production in this area not continued? Basically, the main reason for this, there was no market. There was nobody to sell to. So although you had these massive factories in operation, there was absolutely no point to them because nobody was able to buy the goods that they were producing. And don't forget, at this time, China was not outward looking. It was not looking to trade with other countries. And people within China were still too poor to afford the products being manufactured. This, though, changed from 1979. On the 1st of January 1979, the first foreign investment contract was signed. This allowed a shipbreaker's yard to trade with construction companies in Hong Kong. Why do you think this was so pivotal in China's economic reform? Well, the reason for this then, it initiated or started the first of many trade deals that China could strike with other countries, providing markets for China to sell to and ultimately earn money from. 
Prior to this, the home market had offered no such opportunity. And that's why we had the issues in the Pearl River Delta, because there was nobody there to buy the products. The area quickly became one of the first four special economic zones that worked with the central without central government interference and permitted market forces to operate. They became successful. Hong Kong in particular took advantage of the cheap labour and it was rolled out to a larger scale, with smaller businesses being able to spring up everywhere, particularly in Guangzhou. People were granted private enterprise licences which enabled them to set up small companies. So rather than being under the watchful eye of the government, people had more freedom to become successful businesses. Number eight, the Communist Party was able to push through large construction projects, but they recognized that greater reform was needed in terms of human capital. In other words, they needed to utilize their population better. What did this actually involve in the end? So, more power was given to those at the mid-level to oversee their areas rather than all decisions being made centrally. So this was in a way um, an opportunity to disperse the government's power. So rather than the main government in Beijing making all the decisions, they allowed smaller areas or provinces to kind of make the decisions that were relevant to them. The other thing they did was they encouraged students to attend universities abroad and get expertise from other countries. And finally, they reformed schools and particularly encouraged female participation. Number nine, political liberalization was still not on the agenda for Deng. There was just a focus on economic and technological reform. So it was still very much a communist party, but economic reforms were much more aligned to capitalism. In 40 years, how much did GDP increase by? And it's 70 times, just through the major reforms that Deng pushed through quite quickly. Number 10, China's high-speed rail network is bigger than the top 10 countries combined. How has it been able to do this so quickly? Basically, the main reason that China is able to build so much in terms of the rail networks is because there is a real lack of regulation in comparison to other countries. There's not as much in terms of administrative difficulties that other countries might face. China's government made the decision that they wanted a high speed rail network. And that's what happened. They didn't have to kind of, you know, appease lots of different people and groups or organizations. They decided that's what they wanted to do, and so they did it. They learned about the technology that was being used in other countries and set to work on it really quickly. Number 11. What evidence is there that China's power extends globally, both economically and culturally? Well, this is something we're going to look at in more detail in an upcoming lesson. But there's something known as the Belt and Road Initiative, which is linking trade to other parts of Asia and also around the world. The other element in terms of the cultural influence or power links to things like filmmakers. Filmmakers in Hollywood who are looking for the next blockbuster will only okay a script, in other words, give a script the go ahead if it won't cause offence in China. China has become a huge market and they want their films to be shown in their cinemas. So again, this is showing the influence that China is having on the world culturally. Number 12, what does China's long-term vision involve? China is seeking to become a leader in artificial intelligence and robotics, with companies like Alibaba and Huawei challenging the supremacy of the US. They've also signed up to the Paris Climate Agreement and seek to become a global leader on climate change. Number 13, what challenge does China need to be aware of if its quest for leadership is to be realized? The thing is, China is still very much run as a communist country. Its political ideology of one party rule that its highly educated workforce may reject in the future. But there is still an appreciation for a style of government that has effectively brought rapid abundance and growth. So at the moment, it's not likely to be an issue for a while. So you may wish to pause the video back there and go back and fill in any other answers that you might have missed. 
To finish off the lesson, here are a few tasks to help you apply your understanding from the video that you've just watched and also to develop and go a little further. So number one, it says it's clear there's a wide gap in income between those in rural areas and those in urban areas in China. There's a map on the next slide that you're going to look at in more detail to illustrate this. So firstly, when you look at the map, you're going to describe the variation in income across China. And then secondly, you're going to consider why it's difficult to bridge that gap. Why is it difficult to ensure that rural areas have a similar level of income to those people living in urban areas? So this is the map you're going to look at. So you're going to describe the differences in income in different areas across China. And remember, when you're approaching this, look for an overall pattern. Use things like compass points and make sure you're backing up with specific figures. And if there's any anomalies in that pattern that you've identified, make sure you try to describe those as well. And remember, your second question to answer is why is it difficult to get the rural area incomes to be on a level with the urban areas? When you've done that, question two, I want you to think about, well, what could the government do to try and reduce that gap? So recognising that it's difficult, it doesn't mean that they shouldn't try to, to get the um, income to be more equal. So what could they do? And then thirdly, and this takes a real sort of moment to think about, China continues to experience economic growth, even when other countries have had a slump. Why do you think this is? Do you think this momentum can continue? So again, that's a question to really think about. But I'm going to pause the video there and let you finish off the lesson on your own. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.